Welcome back, everyone. Over to you, Mark. Fantastic. And uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon to everyone joining. Uh, what a great conference so far. Uh, really enjoyed the, uh, the sessions. But uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Mark Shulks. I'm from Adobe. I'm part of the product marketing uh, team over here in the APAC region. A um, bit of background for me. Uh, I work for the company that, of course, brings you Photoshop. But uh, prior to uh, my 18 years at Adobe, I've had roles working in an actual Photoshop where you actually took film and developed that. For those of you who remember that, um, I've worked in many um, organizations actually using Photoshop. And then over the, over the course of my career, helped many organizations really focus on their creative workflows, their digital asset management um, deployments. And of course, now I work for uh, Adobe where we, we create that technology. So today we're going to talk about how to optimize creative ops and uh, really deliver some of these personalized experiences. So let's think about, you know, what's driving this in the first place. I think it's fair to say that, you know, the, the pandemic has, has brought a lot of change to the expectations around customer experience. And at the highest level of any organization, we need to reflect on that and think about what does it mean for everything we do? The brands that succeeded uh, during this transition to digital were the ones who really thought about how they embrace digital and deliver not just an on-par experience, but a really personalized one. What I mean by that is that, you know, personalization, the way we actually present an experience to consumers now is not just one fits all. It has to be something that meaningful. So that means it has to respect my, my role in the customer journey. It has to reflect um, who I am and what my buying behavior is what I've shared with the brand in the past, how loyal I am, uh, all of these different things. And if you're sitting here going, oh, hang on, this is a creative ops uh, discussion. Why are we talking about personalization? You are right in the target as far as having a, a, a bit of pain coming towards you as each brand starts to think about personalization. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, if we don't do it, customers get frustrated. So there will be a demand to, to do this. But think of where we are now. I mean, in my background, I remember this, we always joke about this. The way we handle files today, in some cases, is the way we handle creative processes even 20 years ago. We work on something on our desktop, we create it, we send it off to someone, they come back with changes. So I stick a number two on the end of it. We all go through the approval and we say, that's the final version, but yet there's another change. So now it's the final, final version. And we laugh about this every year, but it still happens all the time. And of course, if you're the creative ops person, if you're running that process, you're scratching your head going, this is costing me a lot of money. Uh, and how do I keep track of everything? So if I think about this and I think about personalization, we've got to look at the right-hand side first to see what problem we're, we're facing here. Look at the scale of the number of assets. Let's zoom in on that for a second here. Um, if you have a thousand products and any brand, you know, this is a, an existing customer of ours. If you're a brand that has a thousand products as a, um, as a starting point, if you think about all the different assets, so assets in use, um, imagery, video, photography, et cetera, um, you know, the product, the product in use, lifestyle shots, et cetera. And then you start to think about global regions and markets that's a big scale factor between, you know, the amount of products you have and the amount of assets you have. I'm probably telling you things you already know here as far as the scale, but let's put personalization uh, into play here. The more data that we get about our consumers and what their preferences are, the more that I need to respond with great content. You can't just send the same content to everyone which means for every new audience type that our, our friends over in the, the marketing land who are you know, working on their um, you know, audience segmentation, et cetera, the expectation now is we say, okay, we know that this person's a repeat buyer. We know someone is a first purchaser and new to the brand. We know that someone may be disgruntled and we've got to manage that engagement really delicately right now. The more we know about where someone is on that journey, we have to have the right content at the right time, which means it's not about executing campaigns like we used to, where we plan it, we roll it out and we deploy it and we hope for the best. We've got to have those assets ready to go. So look at the size. We went from a thousand products to almost 4 million products 
um, based on, you know, just 10x audience uh, destinations. So, you know, many brands will go through different phases of this. Um, personalization is something you uh, work through over time. Um, but it's it's something that essentially is, is on everyone's radar from an executive team top down to drive these personalized engagements based on the data that we're collecting. Now, if we go one step further here, the good news is there are some things we can take for granted now. Uh, so it's not all doom and gloom. There's a good opportunity for, in front of us. Um, we had these cloud native solutions before. Um, the idea that we can, you know, instead of managing software and managing versions, we can just, you know, log into an environment and, and start to take advantage of the capabilities. You know, I don't think any of us could have gotten through the last two years without this distributed access and control. Um, I remember, you know, doing network deployments and server deployments in the same building, you know, in the next room from where all my creative team were because of the large volumes of files that they need to move around. Now you can kind of forget about all that. It's in the cloud, you go and access it, you go and pull down the files no matter where you are. At the same time, more options for automation. I'll touch on this as we go through, but this is not, you know, hiring a highly trained professional now to go and automate my workflow. There are so many options around low code, no code automation, where anyone can really start to say, hey, we do this process all the time. Let's not do it manual anymore. Let's actually automate that process. And then finally, you know, we live in a world where we're used to collaborating. We're all working in real time now. You're, you're live. Hi there. Um, you know, let's take advantage of that in the, in the workflow. So if we're not taking this for granted, we absolutely can, and we should be thinking about that as table stakes before we move into optimizing our business. And so that's what I want to move into now um, is we start to think about, well, how does, how does the adoption of digital asset management and work management really start to get our creative ops team and our processes ready for um, you know, taking advantage and getting ready for this demand for 10x the amount of content we need to produce. So I'm going to go through these three areas, connecting the content lifecycle, making us more efficient, and then getting into the automation area. Let's, uh, let's start with number one. So connecting the content lifecycle. Well, first of all, what is the content lifecycle? Well, we need to think about this in three parts of what we do in an organization. Now, in some organizations, these can be completely separate teams, depending on how big uh, the brand is that you're working for. In some organizations, it could be all of you and you're doing everything yourself. But we need to acknowledge there's a strategy piece where we say, okay, what's our objective here? Like, why are we doing anything at all? Um, what are our goals? What do we hope to get out of this? Um, the middle piece being around the content orchestration, actually getting things done, creating those raw assets, getting them approved, and then finally handing them over into an experience delivery team. In some case, that might be another organization. It could be a marketing team to actually get them where they need to go into the right channels, into the right uh, deliveries. Now, of course, in an ideal world, this all should be aligned. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. But let's look at the, some of the pitfalls and, and current state that we might be facing. So an example is you could have really good creative uh, orchestration of your, your experiences. You're handing them over to experience delivery. But if you don't have that alignment with the strategy, you might be you know, shaking your head sometimes going, I don't really know what I'm working on here. Uh, we seem to be creating things and then it's all too late. We keep changing it or dropping it. Uh, we're really, really busy. We don't know which one is you know, a higher priority. Um, so that content orchestration needs to be aligned with the, the planning and the goal setting you know, right at the front. Um, for those of you, you know, share the frustration in, in the past around, you know, making sure that the, the creative team has a voice and is actually known for its contribution back to the business. This is often the gap where we don't have that direct alignment. At the same time, if we have strategy and content orchestration aligned, we start to think about, you know, project management tools, et cetera, you know, and pushing that into content orchestration. If we're not lining this up with our delivery side, then we, we miss that backflow of, of great intelligence as far as, you know, who is the audience that are in, end up seeing this content? Is it working or not? Do I get any automation capability? And so the idea is we want to really start to think about, you know, these three areas together. Now, from a technology perspective, um, the way we look at, at this within Adobe is that you need to be able to link your creative tools so the team's um, you know, in the tools day in, day out, 
you know, not wasting their time going out to meetings and other processes, but um, being able to stay in those tools as much as possible to be efficient. Leveraging asset management to not just be the process at the end of the program where everything's done and good assets go to die. We spend a lot of effort creating these assets. We want to make sure it becomes a living, breathing part of our, um, you know, our MarTech stack and our delivery stack. But then bringing in work management and making sure that um, all of these three areas are aligned. So I've got different personas looking at different areas, but I, as a business, I've got complete control of um, my content lifecycle. Now, to go one step further here and um, think about how we drive this into efficiency, this is where we start to think, okay, well, again, where am I spending my time? This is a, a result of a survey that we, uh, we did at Adobe recently around, you know, the future of creative experiences. And the results were kind of not surprising, but at the same time, quite deflating in that on average, we see creative work being only 30% of what creatives do. Why? Well, they're going and getting briefs. They're going back and checking things. They're in meetings. They're trying to align different things and, and just really struggling to keep up to date. You know, so 70% of the time is a non-creative task. Ideally, if we can make that uh, more efficient and, and learn from, you know, what we do day in, day out, then we can absolutely take advantage of that. Which kind of leads to, you know, an obvious finding that we've found, you know, especially in the last two years, is that, you know, work itself is the tier one asset, right? It's the, it's the talent within your organization. You know, there was great mention of that in some of the sessions earlier today um, about, you know, how, you know, teams can really understand the business and, and become, you know, very efficient. We want to make sure that, you know, the work itself, when we're, um, you know, understanding what needs to be done, that we've got a track record of, of how to, you know, understand the strategy behind it and, and the execution. So, you know, to put this into different words, um, you know, a lot of questions that we often ask ourselves, being able to answer, right? And uh, a lot of us have heard about the, you know, the great resignation, you, you know, if I'm not directly impacting on the company or I, I'm not aware of how I'm impacting on the company, then why does my work even matter? And, you know, if I'm trying to work out what is my entire team doing, you know, in a hybrid world when we're all working, et cetera, remotely, or even if we're starting to transition back, how do I make sure that I stay on, on top of who's working on the project? Um, not just, you know, the budget as far as it costs, but if I've got all these requests coming in, how do I make sure I've got the right resource allocation and I know what my capacity is based on evidence, not on, you know, ideal idealistic, um, you know, thought, right? If you're anything like me, I always think something takes half the time or even less than what it actually does. Um, so we can actually go and, you know, answer all these questions now. And this is where it comes back to that content life cycle. So we really need to think about, okay, what are all the different steps? Um, appreciate it's not always linear here, but we need to think about if we go from a campaign, we break that down, you know, we set that up. We think of the creative element, we get into our production bill, we go through approval processes, and then we get into deployment. The idea here is to have two layers underneath that. Um, asset management, where I've got a digital asset capability that's really my one source of truth. Now you might be thinking, well, hang on, are you trying to sell me an asset management system? I want you to think about asset management as a category, and then there's products that obviously fit into that. You should be thinking about having one asset, as in one video, one file, one, you know, whatever it is, and transitioning it through the entire workflow. It may move between different systems, but rather than having, you know, different systems to manage it, you keep control of that entire process. And we do that via work management as well. So the idea is that as I'm going through and doing a top-down rollout of a campaign, I know all the subtasks, I know who needs to do what. As I go through the approval process, et cetera, I'm not moving these files around. I have an element of management to say, okay, at this point in time, here's the file for you. Now, where how this gets answered is by a combination of, you know, work management and content intelligence, where we can really start to say, you know, what do we know about an asset at any point in time as it's being worked on? So, you know, who created and why are we even creating this in the first place? 
being able to find it and, you know, if there's any repeat work, being able to go and access that um, content, being able to dig up dark assets that, you know, historically we couldn't find just by thinking in human terms. Like I need to, I remember I ran a campaign. It was really successful. Uh, there was an image of a person jogging down the road, um, you know, and actually typing that in and getting those results back versus relying on someone to manually enter metadata. Um, and then, you know, all the approval rights, et cetera, as it goes through this process, being able to understand, you know, where was it used and how well did it perform? This is some of that backflow of information coming in to say, well, the next time I need to produce an asset, what works? And how do I learn from that and feed that into the process? So my, my creative teams are not just, you know, starting from a blank slate each time. We're getting smarter and smarter as an organization. And we're driving that content intelligence back into the hands of the people that need to do that. So we're making our teams more efficient by tracking their workflow, learning on, you know, what it actually takes to deliver these campaigns. And we're driving insight as far as, you know, what works and, and what we can do better. Now, the Adobe way of doing this is to tie this together with technology and also enrich it with metadata. Um, so the top line of this slide here, you can see um, uh, some familiar Adobe logos as far as our creative cloud. And we want people to stay in the creative tools if they're creative, you know, as much as possible uh, without moving out. So um, we've got plugins and connections within, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, et cetera, um, where I can actually go and see, you know, work assignments. I can check in and out files. I can do the work that's needed without, you know, picking up and going somewhere else to go and find my next task. Underneath that, a layer of work management, uh, and you've heard uh, Workfront mentioned a few times, it was an acquisition Adobe did in uh, late uh, 2020. Being able to go through that entire campaign tracking process, jump in and out of our digital asset management tool, which is AM Assets, and picking up files you know, outside of that ecosystem as well. If they're outside of the organization or they're in a creative cloud library, um, wherever they are, being able to get the right content into the right person's hands with them the manually have to go to a meeting, find it where it is, go and grab that. Because we just know all those manual steps are taking time and that's what you know drains the efficiency from the team. And then the bottom layer here is whenever we can, we enrich the, the metadata, we enrich the content itself um, by reaching out and using intelligence such as smart tagging to understand you know, what's in an asset, what color is it? Is it the right color? Um, to make sure it, you know, we can preempt some of those approval processes. You know, going through the approval and, and storing that back so everyone can see that where it's needed, you know, who signed off on it when. And then you know, bringing in product data on the left-hand side, bringing in CDP or customer data platform information about you know, particular users. So the idea is I can say, hey, that particular asset works really well with new customers, but you know, mature customers prefer something else. And it could be stylistic, it could be tone, it could be um, you know, anything related to that. So while this might sound futuristic, we have many customers working on this now, both big and small. Um, I encourage you, if you want to, to understand a few more um, use cases, is to look at a recording from an Adobe customer, Under Armour, um, where they were able to um, automate you know, things such as their um, photography sessions and bring that in without rekeying in metadata. Uh, and get that right through the process without manually moving files around. Um, of course, we heard a great session today from Xero, uh, from Snyder Electric, and there's many customers out there, both big and small. But I want to just end up here and talk about number three, and this is around content automation. So the idea is that, and we know this, is that the things that creatives don't enjoy, apart from going to meetings, is mundane and repetitive tasks. And what I mean by that is we have an opportunity to go and really automate more than ever before. If I move forward and show you what this looks like is a lot of the things we now take for granted in our smartphones when we're working through photography, et cetera, and bringing them into the creative process with the fidelity and the richness. So you can see here, there's something I spent a lot of time doing day in, day out is going to Photoshop, removing backgrounds. We've progressively made that faster in Photoshop as an example, but we can do better than that. There is a lot of opportunities to have more people involved in this process and be part of that, that marketing uh, or that creative process here where I'm taking assets and I'm allowing, you know, potentially non-creatives to use creative um, templates 
and processes to go and quickly create variations uh, for delivery here. Now, all of this is done through point and click in our asset management system. So it's respecting the creativity. In many cases, we can even give back a, like a PSD if you want to finesse something. But this helps you accelerate and get the right file at the right time you know, with the right setup, you know, based on your creative principles. But hand off some of this back to automation and hand it off to other people who need to maybe create, you know, a slightly different version rather than going right back to the creative team in the first place. These are the ways that we can get through and, and, and automate these processes and make you deliver faster. Now, just to wrap up here, you know, Dell did a great story about metadata, the use of personalization, how they're actually driving the screen coordinates um, to drop out, you know, the backgrounds and the, uh, the, the laptop screens here. Definitely worth, you know, checking that out as a, um, a session. But, you know, putting all these three together is how you can start to, um, to, to build up this automation and drive efficiency and get you ready for personalization, which, you know, starting now will take time. So it's, it's right time to do that. So I'll just wrap up here and say, join these three things together, have alignment in workflow, alignment in, in, in strategy. Um, there is definitely business impact in doing that. And, and we can absolutely share, you know, plenty of case studies on what, you know, Adobe customers are seeing, you know, the value from here. And then finally, I'll leave these up here. If you want to go and look at some of these sessions, take a screen grab now, um, use your QR code on your phone to go and look up the, um, the links here, but uh, some great stories from our customers and uh, you know, from third-party analysts as well. I'm available for chat. Feel free to look me up on LinkedIn or um, I'll head over now to the exhibition lounge if you want to uh, discuss further, but uh, thanks for joining me today. It's been a great session. Talk to you soon.